Cool. So uh, my name is Brian Shepard, and I work pretty much as a, a guide almost full time lately. Um, and so I, I part of my job is to really keep a pulse, uh, a finger on the pulse of the stream. And there are a few different signs of whether or not or not our streams are clean, uh, if the waters are clean and cold enough. And that is really revolves around the macro invertebrates. Um, the healthier the water is, the more oxygen, the colder the water is, the the cleaner the air surrounding it, etc., uh, will really dictate, um, you know, kind of what lives in it, um, and vice versa. If I see, um, you know, living organisms like caddis or stoneflies, mayflies, I already know right away that that is a really clean, healthy stream. Um, so they both kind of work as barometers for each other. You know, naturally, with Trout Unlimited, for instance, we're really concerned about conservation and about the trout, but the trout cannot exist without food and so that's kind of what we we deal with especially as fly fishermen we need to figure out the food um pretty quickly and kind of solve that with our flies selection and that's going to be our our solution you know kind of our key to catching fish for the day um there's a chart i believe i don't know if uh, lily shared it but there is a chart with the different macroinvertebrates but we are really only concerned, uh, they're all important, uh, they're all necessary, but there are a few really, really, really important uh, bugs that we're, we're really worried about as far as, as fishermen and, and tires and conservationists. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and do a screen share real quick. Um, my phone, I've never done this, so let's hope this works. Um, okay, zoom. Okay, oh, cool. uh, can everyone see this? Mm -hmm. Okay, you can, okay, good. So this is, uh, yeah. I'm gonna go through a few different basic food sources that we're really, really concerned with and our worlds kind of revolve around in the fly fishing world. Um, this is your first one, you may recognize him. Um, this is a rhinocophilia. It's um, a, what, it's also known as a green rock worm. And it does, it looks exactly like this. They, they can be anywhere from a few millimeters all the way up to probably a half an inch is the largest I've seen. Um, they're kind of a chartreuse color when they're under sunlight and not under a, you know, a, a crazy microscope like this. Um, we also have probably what's even more important, which is the, the tan rockworm or a hydropsyche, um, which is another caddis um, um, larva. Uh, the caddis is really one of our only insects we're really concerned with that has a full metamorphosis. So um, this is its first stage, its, its larval stage, um, which is really, really important. It probably makes up, I'd say, I would estimate probably 65% of a trout's diet revolves around these little guys. Um, and so these both are very cool. They're really, really similar, except for this one here spins a net um, with its little legs there at the very bottom around, around the tail section, can actually spin a web to catch its own food. Um, then they have a pupil stage. Um, sorry for the screenshot here, but this is the caddis pupa. And um, again, mayflies don't pupate, but caddis do. And so this is another important stage um, in a healthy stream. They will actually pupate and they'll get these little wings on them and then they'll flap to the surface and fill up with air. And that will kind of, it's like a hot air balloon almost, and they'll take them to the surface. Um, and then they will become the adult, which is this guy right here. This is the hydropsyche adult on your screen. Um, it's also a spotted sedge um, or a tan caddis. And this is probably our number one most popular trout food source in New York State and probably in the world. Um, these are cool. And when trout feed on them, it's pretty spectacular. They go nuts. It's like the Snickers bar for a trout. Um, there's close up. You can see they're pretty, pretty cool, almost like a moth, really. Um, then our other, our, that was our caddis, and then this is our, our nymph uh, of the mayfly here. This is a betis nymph, or um, you know, a blueing olive is what we call them quite often. Um, you can see uh, little wing pads, and that's really where the wings are stored as it's a nymph. It has little gills, which are the ribs all the way down the body. Um, the tails, which help balance the fly, the nymph as it drifts in the current. And then of course these little legs, which helps it crawl around on the rocks. And that's how they start. Um, again, if you turn over any river rock, if you go out for a, um, you know, a trout release with the kids and you turn over a rock together, you will find these if the, if the stream is healthy, they're everywhere. Um, 
they do not have a full metamorphosis, so they don't turn into a pupa at any time. Um, they will simply swim to the top um, and they or to the river's edge and they will hatch into this dun. Um, a dun is a an adult, the adult stage of the mayfly. Typically, they're only going to be flying around for anywhere from 24 hours or 12 hours, maybe all the way up to three days. Um, species of stoneflies can last for weeks. But in general, with good weather, these guys really don't last. Their lifespan is not long. They really, they, they hatch. They don't really feed much. They mate and then they die. So this is your second stage of the mayfly. They're really pretty. Um, that's a March Brown. It's about, that's about a one and a half inch long mayfly. They're huge. Um, and finally, you can see the stages, the final stage, um, which is your spinner stage. So after they have um, done what they need to do um, for most mayfly species, they will actually shed their skin, their exoskeleton, or one of their layers of skeleton. And you're left with a very thin body uh, with very clear wings that really look like nothing. A lot of times they come out tattered. And this is the spinner stage. Um, which is really the final stage, their dying stage. So they have already mated, usually they've already mated, and this is the stage in which they will shed this. They will slowly lose protein. Um, they've already lost a lot of it in this stage, and they will flutter to, to, the, to the water surface, and then the trout will feed on them again. It's probably our most productive time to fish a spinner pattern in the fly fishing world. Um, um, and sometimes there are some species that will lay eggs as spinners. So they will actually carry their eggs and lay their eggs when they die. And they will shower the water with microscopic little eggs everywhere. Um, it's pretty spectacular. Usually when they're in this stage and they flutter down, they're often in the thousands, if not millions. So we see them as a cloud, um, a cloud form. Uh, then finally, the other, the, the insect of, of importance, which tend not to be huge in, on the East Coast. Uh, they're a little bit more Western, but we do find them quite a bit. Uh, this is a stonefly. Um, they're huge, they're gnarly looking. When you flip over a rock, they'll probably scare you, especially if they're uh, one of the larger species because they can grow to be up to five inches long. But they're, yeah, it's, it's a little spooky, don't be afraid. They're actually really fun to play with. They don't bite, they don't <laughs> pinch. Um, they're beautiful. This is a golden stone, which isn't that large. Um, this is an iloper, uh, isoperlo uh, nymph, so it's relatively small. But in the larger species, as you go west or into warmer climates, we tend to get really, really, really big. Um, but this is one of my favorite. They're really ornate and, and their they're shell back there, uh, the carapace kind of has some really cool markings. Um, so they also do not have a pupil stage. They don't go through a full metamorphosis. They, they start here, which is how we normally fish them. And most trout love these. It's like a cheeseburger for a trout, uh, if not a steak or something larger. Um, that's a that's the, the larger species uh, there. He looks pretty gnarly. When you see him crawling up your leg, that'll wake you up um, for sure. Um, and this is the adult. It's a little blurry, sorry, but um, that is the adult of the larger salmon fly. Um, and the black stone flies look like this as well. Um, and they're really large. The trout don't feed on them much as adults because they tend to, this is one of the species of mayflies that actually swims to the, or they climb to the water's edge. They climb out of the water or like onto a rock or onto a bush. They hatch there and fly away. So the trout really never see them as adults very often or as emergers. Um, so they don't eat them in the inter interwater column. Um, it's either on the bottom or occasionally um, you might find them when they're falling back to the water surface, if, you know, and, and, the, and the trout might eat them, but I, I very rarely see them. Um, it's, it's kind of difficult. Um, so those are your three species of insects that we worry about in, in our world. And here you go. This is obviously not an insect. I mean, this is a crayfish. So we, what we're going to make today will actually be a streamer, a streamer pattern, which will imitate um, uh, a swimming bait fish or a crawfish. It can any kind of swimming um, um, biomass um, of the larger uh, spectrum, but the, the trout really do key in on these large crayfish. Um, that's a major food source. And then this guy here, which is a sculpin, my favorite you know, thing to imitate. Um, you know, trout are cannibalistic and they are, they do eat, they do predate on other, other large bait fish of different types um, all, and all kinds of things. You know, they eat mice, 
they ate squirrels and birds at times, which is pretty traumatic to think about. But this guy, this is a sculpin, and he's anywhere from an inch all the way up to about four or five inches. And then in salt water, they grow up to several pounds. Um, and they're a very flat fish in order to keep them on the, the, the river's bottom. They use it as a torque, kind of as an airfoil. Um, and they're kind of gnarly looking, but I think they have a lot of character and they're in person, they can be really spectacular to look at. Um, and so that is one of our bait fish and our pattern today will really kind of key in on this, this scheme here. Um, I love these guys and you'll see them in a river all the, in the warmer water, like on the Housatonic in Connecticut or, or maybe even like warmer summer months on the Delaware, you'll see these by the thousands. Um, and then we have terrestrials, which is our, our really kind of final food group that we're concerned with. This is, of course, a, a roly-poly or a sow bug, a crest bug, whatever you want to call it. Um, this food group is going to include things like grasshoppers, ants. They are terrestrials. They are of the earth. So these guys um, are really actually a major food source. Most fly fishermen or people who are rummaging around the stream really don't think about this. Uh, but it's actually quite productive. You know, they're in the vegetation, just like underwater scuds and shrimp. They are on the, the river's edge and rotting logs. And if it's in a flood stage, trout love these things. Um, in the summer, they'll find flying ants to eat. They will target on grasshoppers and um, dragonflies and damselflies in their adult stage. All kinds of other caterpillars, things that are not really waterborne or meant to live in the water or around the water as they wash in worms are also very popular. So that that brings you into kind of the sow bug terrestrial landscape um, that we deal with quite a bit. Um, and also a sign of really healthy, fertile vegetation and good pH in your soil. So if you see these guys, it's a sign that things are, are decaying correctly and kind of feeding back into nature. Um, if you have any questions, just feel free to speak up. Um, so I'm going to show you a few imitations of these, and then we're going to jump right in because we have some ground to cover. Um, if you go back to your um, your caddis, your pupa, sorry, your larva, uh, those little those little rock worms all the way up at the front, we really can imitate those quite easily. It's actually the easiest thing to imitate um, back here. So you, I'll just show you some flies that that cover that. So there is your larva. It's actually made of cat gut that you would use for hook eyes and, and violin strings. Um, so that's a one. Well, there's a pupa that, that we've imitated. Um, and you can see there, you've got your wing pads, your antenna, etc., and 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 they gain kind of a sparkly quality as they fill with air and float to the surface in their kind of self propulsion propulsion in a way. And they can also kind of swim like little paddles. Um, really cool. And whoever tied that did a really, really nice job. And this is your adult caddis, um, kind of your moth um, in, in a way. That is an elk hair caddis is, is the pattern. Um, very simple, very, very famous pattern. Uh, in the mayfly nymphs, when you get into your nymphs, you get into this guy. This is a traditional pheasant tail invented in England in the uh, early 1900s. Um, by a guy named Frank Sawyer. And this is really made of just pheasant tail and a little bit of hair's mask dubbing and a few feathers. And that is your basic profile of, of your, of your uh, mayfly nymph and your adult. So when it, it's the done with the big wings and the long tail, this is a really basic imitation that we make to cover that food source. Uh, that's called a parachute and you can see why. Um, it does look like it. And then when they die and they fall um, spent um, in their spinner form and they flutter to the surface. Their wings usually lay flat and their forked tails hang out and they're all kind of beaten up and that's, that is the spinner form of this guy right here. Um, and then finally, um, we get back to what we're going to tie today. So this is a, a commercial a tie version of it. We're going to tie a, a different version because our colors are all a little different. My colors will be different than yours and our materials may differ a little bit, but um, you can see here, it's basically when it's wet, it will appear to be anything from a leech to a, a minnow to a crawfish. It's kind of an, an all around pattern. And what this is going to teach you is your proportions. Our tail is equidistant, yeah, the equal length of your shank. Um, you have nice space out hackles and all of the different techniques of wrapping, tense, uh, wrapping a rib and everything. So once you tie this fly, you will know the basis for everything we ever do. And from there on, we just build. Okay, so let me pull up my camera. 
So just give me a heads up. If anyone has problems getting the hook in the vise, your vise will look a little different than mine. Um, but ultimately it should be in there like so. You don't wanna have the point covered up because that is a form of measurement and you wanna be able to see the barb of the hook. So you just wanna be able to have a clear view. This barb right here is really important. That's how that is signifies the end of your shank. Okay. So if we're in there, you should be able to kind of bounce your, that's loose. So you should be able to bounce your hook and it shouldn't move too much. If it moves, you need to tighten. All right. Okay. And if I go too fast, please just unmute yourself and let me know. Um, but I will try to keep, I'll try to keep a steady pace. Now, uh, you should have your, your thread in your, your bobbin. And you'll have a working length. Um, as beginners, go ahead and start with a good foot of thread out just so that you can wrap it around your finger and control this thread quite a bit. Um, this spool should freely spin out of your bobbin. If it doesn't, you can bend these out and stretch it and, and that will allow your thread to move freely, okay? Um, so you'll just go ahead and grab a hold of it. We're gonna start up here at the eye of the hook. I'm not gonna start right behind the eye and I'll show you why later. But for now, just start a little ways back, maybe a, a quarter of an inch. You're gonna go away from you over the top of the hook. We're gonna go away over the top and I'm actually just gonna spin this and I'm gonna work my way back. It's kind of like playing a guitar. Your hands aren't gonna to wanna to cooperate. It's a little awkward at first, but the more you practice, the more you get it. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna hold my thread back at an angle and I'm gonna just an open wraps, work my way all the way back. doesn't have to be pretty. You just have to get it back here. Okay? And when my thread hangs on this particular hook, it's going to hang somewhere between the point and the barb of the hook. That's how you know you're in the right place. Okay. And I'll go ahead and I'm just going to get rid of that tag. I don't need it. You should have one of these in, in some color. Um, it's from a chicken. Almost every bird has a form of marabou. It's kind of similar to your down feathers. It's what keeps them warm often uh, and also repels water. Uh, and this is gonna be the back half or the tail of our fly. So you're just gonna go ahead and take your feather. You're gonna pull the fibers back and you're going to measure it against the length of your hook. So I'm gonna take this. This is approximately as long as my, my hook is. As long as it's not too far past the bend, that's okay. So I'm gonna take that and I'm gonna transfer this. I'm gonna grab it with my other hand and pinch and move this back. Now I have that length moving past the back end of the hook back here. I've transferred the measurement, okay? So I'm gonna just come up here with my thread in between my fingers and I'm gonna make a few nice gentle wraps. And there, I can let go of my bobbin and my tail is in. So that is that step. Um, if it's a little short or a little long, it's not the end of the world. Um, but this is gonna be where most of the movement in the fly comes from, your swimming tail of your bait fish. Kinda cool. Um, you have all this waste over here. We're gonna leave that for now. Um, for, for, for just a moment, so don't don't really worry about it. You wanna go ahead and look at the top of your, I look at the top and I'll show you my, my material is on the top of the hook. So you can lift this up and keep your material on the top of that shank. If it rolls, your fly is gonna swim weird. So we just wanna lift this up a little, make sure everything is in place. And you can give it a couple more wraps, okay? Just to bind it right there. Um, okay. Now we have wire. So in your kit, you should have some wire. Um, we can use any kind of wire that you like. Um, I've just got some standard gold wire here. Um, and I'm just gonna go ahead. There's a lot of ways to tie this in. I'm just gonna place this for the sake of ease. We're gonna place it right on top of the shank on your side. 
just a little bit of the of the top material. And I'm gonna make one, two light wraps. Everything is very light. And I'm just gonna let it hang. If I'm using a lot of pressure, my material wants to spin around the hook. Your idea is to be very gentle with all of this until we get to the final stage. So this is all just laying on top of my hook. Once you have that in, go ahead. You can reach in here with your, your scissors and right up towards the eye of the hook. I'm just going to go ahead and get rid of this now. And I'll trim that. If anybody looks pained or, or angry. So right now, all we've done is bound in our rib and our tail. Now I'm just gonna go ahead and clean this up a little bit. Um, no real good way to do it, but I like to just go ahead and wrap my thread forward. I'm just gonna guide it with my fingers and loose wraps. It's gonna look messy and I'm gonna go up and I'm gonna go back down to the back. With big open wraps. So I've just gotten all that under control and now I have a nice smooth body for my next step. simple. Um, in your kits, you will have gotten chenille. Um, I'm on the road, I'm traveling a bit, and I don't actually have chenille with me, so I made some. So don't worry, your material is going to look a little different than mine. I just made this last night uh, by hand. Um, yours will be that fluffy rope of chenille in the pack. You can go ahead and you can trim maybe a, a foot of it for ease, a foot of it maybe, or 10 inches or so, something that you can handle. And you'll have, at the base of it, yours will be a, a silk core. You'll actually have like a little string inside. Mine is wire. But you can go ahead and you can strip off some material and expose the little bit of string inside. And that's how we're going to tie it in. Okay. So you can just lay it back here with everything else. You can tie in your little tiny, you'll have like a little itty bit of length of string getting rid of my wire. So yours will be like a little nub. And you can just go ahead and lash it in. And you're gonna go all the way to the front with your thread. And you'll end back kind of where you started your thread in the first place. That's kind of your indicator of where things will start and end for now. Okay. Now you'll take your chenille simply wrap it side by side all the way to the front. Mine looks a little wonky because it's not real chenille, but you get the idea. So a nice touching turns. You want to try to keep all the gaps out of it. So if you look at your fly from different sides, you won't see any gaps. getting used to doing this uh, around the form. Okay. So you'll tie it off at the end. You can just make a few wraps at the front, however it looks, and then whatever's left over, you can trim. Just make sure it's nice and secure. So you have some kind of big fuzzy body. It's not gonna be perfect. It's fine, because we're gonna cover it up. Um, you'll still have your big trail, you know, end of rib material back here. Um, and that's fine. Just let it hang. So our final material um, will be that crazy feather. I think yours is chartreuse. Um, if I hold it out here, yours will be a different color than mine, and that's fine. Um, this is what's called grizzly. Yours is grizzly, I think, but it's a different color. Um, and you can use a range of feathers. This is from a chicken. Um, we use from some from the Coque de Leon birds. We use them from turkey, from heron, protected heron, obviously, uh, from, from um, cranes and things like that. Um, and occasionally from like birds from the rainforest as well that are protected. We, we will use all kinds of feathers for this. This is your standard chicken feather, okay? And you'll notice it gets, it's, it's, it's thick and dense at one end, 
and it gets really fine. You have a, a taper. And if you stroke these feathers back, you'll notice the stem is pretty thick down here towards the tail. As you move up, you'll, you'll notice a point where it gets really thin. For me, it's somewhere just past these really fuzzy parts. It's right in here somewhere. So just go ahead and I'm gonna get rid of some of those fibers. I'm just gonna pull down on the feather and expose your ratchets or your quill. Okay. So that's all you have to do. And then I'm just gonna reach in here. I'm gonna clip all that off and give myself a nice stub. Now there's, again, there's lots of ways to tie these in. I'm gonna show you my really, really fast way to do it. Because when I tie these, I'm usually doing a few hundred at a time. Um, so it's kind of my way to, my, my simple way. So we're gonna hold this material, this, this feather up to the fly and the curve, it's gonna naturally curve. This is the top of the feather. It's gonna curve right over the back of the fly. Okay. So that's your orientation. You're gonna take some of these feathers that are on the side away from you and you're gonna pluck them, just a couple. So you have some exposed stem. Next step as we wrap, this is actually just gonna make your life easier. You're gonna see why. Um, it's gonna make a nice easy transition as you wrap your, your, your feather around the hook. So from here, this is kind of tricky. So you're gonna pinch it right against the hook. You're gonna make a few wraps. I guess I just did four, so more than a few, four. And if you have a stem, you can fold that back and you're gonna wrap a couple times over it. That way that feather will not pull out. laying with the nice shiny good side up on top of the fly. If you did it the other way, your fibers would actually cut forward and we don't really want that. We want them to cut back and lay back on the fly. Okay. Keeping your rib out of the way, we'll go ahead and we'll lift this feather up. Let me see if I can hold this up a little bit for you to see. Lift this straight up, and I like to start by just going ahead and lightly stroking these feathers back and get your fingers wet, and it will actually help hold the fibers back a little out of your way. And I'm just gonna go ahead and I'm gently going to make one wrap right here at the head. I'm gonna make a second one right behind it, and then working back in big spirals. And every now and then I'll I'll stroke them back. I'm just gonna like them back, spiral them openly, so that I can still see the body of the fly underneath. When I get very all the way back to the tail, I'll stop. Hold it right here. This is called palmering. When you spin hackle like this, it's palmering, and it's probably the number one, one of the number one skills. Um, I'll go ahead and I'll unwrap and I'll do it again. <laughs> Got my start, one in place, one right behind it. And what that does is it builds density towards the front of your fly. Aesthetically, it makes the fly balanced. You have a lot of material towards the tail, so we want to increase the material in the front just a little bit. It's more for us, less for the fish. Uh, we just like the way it looks. It's kind of that dorsal fin of the sculpin, you know, with all that material in the, in the head of the fly. And as you move back, you open it up wider and wider and wider and wider. So you can see the balance of the fly and the, the, the fiber length is tapered naturally. So holding this here, and if you end at the back of the tail, you'll be right, actually, there we go, now I'm at the back of the tail. You'll be right next to your rib now this is a little tricky, but you can grab your rear rib and you can reach under here and you can spin it the opposite way. So I'm gonna go up over the hook. Now I've just trapped my feather, I can actually let go. So you're gonna bring it under just like a thread wrap and you're gonna trap that fiber right, right in there. And I'm gonna come forward and I'm gonna zigzag and just spiral this all the way from zigzagging to try to not trap as many hairs as I can. Big open wraps. 
by tensile. It's not ex totally necessary to do this with a rig, but your fly, when you catch a fish, it will last much longer. It's really an issue of durability. And then when you get to the front, you can go ahead, lift that over a few times, just trapping my, my rib. Hold it back. Hold it. Just gonna go ahead with the two wraps right in place. So the question is, what do you do now? I mean, technically your fly is done. We'll go through and trim it in a minute, but everything is 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 pretty much complete. Um, now, as long as you keep tension on your thread, this is a little tricky. Um, they make tools for this, but I'll show you how I do it with my hand. And you can use a pin cap for this as well, if you have one. But I'll just go ahead and I'm gonna wrap over my finger down. So I'm actually wrapping backwards towards the fly, you see, like this. And I'm just gonna go ahead and slide that loop on me. Just around the finger. It's really tying a little knot around the hook. I just did three of those. There's lots of different knots you can do. That's the, the simplest. You throw two or three on there. Reach in. Flip everything. Get rid of my little feather in the back that's hiding. You may have some trap feathers you can kind of bring on this forward. If you have a brush or anything like that, I even use my scissors sometimes. Not come in here and pull out the errant fibers. <laughs> so that is essentially the woolly bugger. That is like your number one standard um, trout stream or fly that imitates all those swimming creatures under the water. It's like an overall uh, attractor. It covers every base. You fish it anywhere for any species, even in salt water, and you will catch fish. When it gets wet, I dunk it. See, as it gets wet, it really slips down into a leech swimming creature pulses and all, all these little fibers uh, send out electric, electric uh, signals to the lateral line of your trout and, and really kind of attract them and move with the current. That's your little bait fish fly. 